Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to ISNA seminar. Maybe good morning in United States, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> today, so I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, so <clears throat> Professor uh, Srinivas Garimera from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. So I briefly uh, introduce his uh, background. So 1982, so he uh, uh, graduated from the IIT Kapu in India. Then uh, he uh, <clears throat> received a, a master degree in Ohio State University in 1984. And in 1990, uh, he received a PhD uh, degree. So after that, he <coughs> uh, worked as a, a research scientist in, in uh, General Motors. Then, so uh, after that, so she <coughs> became an um, associate professor at the Western Michigan University and Iowa State University. But now, currently, he is a high tower chair in uh, engineering, uh, professor and director. Uh, sustainable thermal system laboratory of Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. So uh, <clears throat> he is very uh, active, and uh, so uh, yeah, it's very difficult to uh, uh, introduce in a short period. <laughs> so, but he uh, is serving as uh, uh, many uh, uh, journal editors, and also he received. Uh, <clears throat> award from many societies. Okay, now he's uh, uh, he is uh, working in the field of uh, of phase chain heat transfer, and the today talk is yeah, reducing the carbon footprint of energy utilization through advances in micro scale uh, heat and mass transfer. He he wrote a very uh, famous book in uh, <coughs> in micro channel. I have uh, that book, okay? So uh, please uh, start the talk. Welcome to the ISNA, okay? Uh, arigato gozaimasu. Uh, that's the only Japanese I know, and I'm sure I, I said it wrong, but uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the honor of speaking at this uh, uh, seminar today. This is my first time not only at uh, Kyushu University, but uh, this is my first time in Japan. and. Um, I'm uh, really pleased with the uh, uh, welcome that I've received here, and I hope this is just uh, the first of many trips I make uh, uh, to Japan and to Kyushu. And I must uh, thank my host, uh, uh, Professor Takata, and uh, um, Professor Saha, and many others who've uh, made this visit possible. So I want to share with you some of the things that we do here uh, in our lab. And uh, it's, a, it's a variety of things that we do, but with the goal of trying to reduce the carbon footprint of energy utilization. Um, in a center like this, you may have heard many talks about uh, uh, the supply side, how energy is generated. But my focus today will be on the utilization side. Maybe that's a little bit different from what you've heard before. So uh, let's get started. and. Uh, this is the outline of the talk. So first of all, I'll talk about how thermal energy is used. What is the landscape for energy use? And then I'll talk about phase change heat and mass transfer. This is the disciplinary specialty that I bring to the table uh, to enable innovations and that lead to the goal that I mentioned. We'll talk about some novel applications as an illustration of how we do this. Uh, for example, we'll talk about miniaturized uh, vapor compression heat pumps, thermally activated uh, micro heat pumps, which uh, use the adsorption principle. We'll also talk briefly about adsorption. I know there's a lot of adsorption research going on here at Kyushu. We'll talk about how to use uh, low-grade waste heat, which is thrown away throughout the world right now, and not just recover it, but also to upgrade it to better forms of energy. We'll talk about megawatt scale energy harvesting in naval ships. And we'll talk about thermal management of electrochemical storage systems. 
Uh, storage is a very, very important topic, especially when you're trying to do um, diffuse temporarily and spatially. When you're trying to use uh, diffuse forms of energy, uh, concentration and storage is a big issue. And we'll talk briefly about carbon capture, too. Okay. And then I'll give my perspective and outlook uh, on what I see coming in the future. So just to uh, tell you uh, where we do some of this research, this is uh, some pictures from my lab. It is called the Sustainable Thermal Systems Lab. It's uh, very similar to the kinds of labs I saw today, perhaps uh, not as uh, grandiose as the uh, um, Professor Ito's lab that I saw with the large uh, uh, supercritical facility. But we have, uh, uh, we have a high pressure boiler that supplies uh, steam to the lab. Uh, and also these are the, the uh, steam and chilled water lines. We have a wind tunnel that uh, we control the uh, uh, temperature and humidity to high and low temperature so that we can do heating and cooling experiments at a variety of uh, temperatures and humidities. We have some environmental chambers where we can do controlled um, uh, environment testing of a variety of uh, systems that we develop. And then we have uh, about 25 different individual steam stations where we can control and regulate the pressure so that we can run experiments simultaneously at a wide variety of conditions. We have a big chiller dedicated to the lab where uh, that provides the heat sink for most of our experiments. And we also have a very, very low temperature chiller that takes us down to minus 55 Celsius. So with that, we can cover this thermal utilization landscape that I'll, I'll uh, talk about. Here are some representative test facilities. There's an absorption chiller, for heat and mass transfer facility. Here's a two-phase flow test facility. This is an absorption system breadboard. Uh, here's a, a natural refrigerant CO2 heat pump test facility. And here's a micro-scale phase change test facility. These are just some representative um, uh, pictures of our test facilities, similar to the ones that I saw uh, here yesterday and today, and some of you students are working on these kinds of facilities here also. So here are some uh, test sections. We do experiments on phase change in very, very small geometries. All right, so what about this thermal energy landscape? You may or may not realize this, but in whichever way you actually use energy these days, it's mostly uh, thermal. So 81% uh, of the world's primary energy supply is coming in some thermal form. It goes through some thermal transformation. It may be fossil fuels, and it has to be burned to prov provide heat, and then the heat is used for something else. Okay? And if you include nuclear power in this, about 87%, uh, and even higher if you use the solar thermal energy route also. So about 90% of the, of the energy that is used by mankind goes through some thermal process. So those of you who are studying heat transfer or thermal sciences, you are in, uh, in the right business, OK? The world will always need you. So with that, what are some thermal challenges and what are some thermal innovations we can do to help the world uh, uh, achieve the mission that you have set for yourself in this uh, Eisner uh, center, and that is the carbon neutral pathway. Uh, this is a map of the United States, uh, which is where I teach. Uh, but this is relatively true for most countries throughout the world. These are the various sources of energy that come into the US infrastructure, so, so coal, natural gas, and various other sources. These are the various end uses. Okay? This is how energy is used for residential, commercial, industrial purposes, and so on. But rather than the details, the two things I want you to pay attention to is this one and this one. This is the amount of electricity that is generated, equivalent to about 15 quadrillion BTUs that is generated in the US. But this is the conversion losses. To be able to generate this much electricity, this much energy is thrown away. And the picture is not that different for the whole world. There is a lot of wasted thermal energy throughout the world. Okay? Even in the days when we talk about the energy crisis and so on, we are throwing away a, a lot of heat. More heat is being thrown away than 
is being used for useful purposes. Okay? Another way of looking at it, if you have a power plant, okay, you burn fossil fuel, a thermally driven power plant, you burn fossil fuel and um, you're using, so you're using the, the high temperature end of that energy and you're throwing away waste heat and the lower temperature scales. You're just throwing that away. If you use a domestic water heater, especially in the United States, you are burning natural gas or you're burning some other fossil fuel and you're wasting a lot of the thermal availability in that energy stream only to heat water to about say 60 to 90 degrees Celsius. You could have done that with a much colder source than the over 1000 degrees Celsius source that is burning fossil fuel. Instead, if you were to find a cascaded way of utilizing the energy, so you burn the energy once, and then the waste heat from this process you use to run this process, the waste heat from here you run this process, and so on, then you're getting multiple uses out of this one stream of energy. So if you develop clever systems and processes, you can make this happen, and I'll try to illustrate how to do this throughout this, this talk. One other way of looking at it, the world is full of a, a wide variety of individual processes where this is the, the uh, useful work being uh, uh, produced, and then there is this much waste. There may be some useful work here, and this is the waste. Okay? This is if they are used independently. On the other hand, if you do the cascading that I talked about in the previous slide, then the waste from here, instead of being treated as waste, drives this process so that there's no new energy required. And so with that cascaded energy utilization, you can decrease the primary energy requirements substantially. So this is not a case of improving the individual efficiencies of processes, but the way that we use energy in society. So once you achieve this, then you can also develop individual processes and improve their efficiencies a little bit. And then that will get you even further reductions in the energy utilization. Okay? So now, rather than spending this much energy, you only need to spend this much energy for the overall energy needs of society. When you decrease it from this large quantity to this quantity, then you can do a few other things. A lot of the renewable, renewable energy sources that, that uh, are available out there, like solar, wind, and so on, they are available in temporally varying ways. So the sun comes up in the day and goes down in the night, and the wind blows in unpredictable ways. If you can somehow smooth this out by providing energy storage, and if you can take diffuse forms of energy, diffuse forms of low-grade energy, low-temperature, low-grade waste energy, and concentrate it into higher temperature, concentrated sources of energy, then you have started addressing the, the energy needs well. And then you're only supplying, instead of this much, you're only supplying this much. So most discussions about renewable energy end when they see, oh my god, I have to supply this much energy using carbon neutral sources. Where am I going to get all these carbon neutral sources? The sun is only available for a few hours of the day. The wind blows once in a while. You know, where, where will I get all this? So it's hard when you look at it this way. But if you have to only supply this much, then the mission of this center, for example, becomes a lot easier because the carbon neutral part that you need to supply is much smaller. Then you can attack it with solar, uh, wind, biomass, and so on and so forth. So this is the landscape that we have. And in our lab, we do some of this. We use a wide variety of waste heat from, say, food processing, from chemical process plants, from engine exhaust, from computer clusters, and metals fabrication, all of these. And then we subject them to these processes, either adsorption, absorption, vapor compression and expansion, or electrochemical conversion. And then these are the outputs from some of the work that we do. We do some carbon capture, we do heating, we do cooling, we produce some work out of waste heat, and we also do energy storage. To be able to do this, 
we have to study the essentials of heat and mass transfer at the micro scales so that once we understand those principles, we can apply them to do these kinds of systems, okay? So uh, many of you are studying thermodynamics, uh, maybe the basic thermodynamics, the advanced thermodynamics, and so on. There are a variety of cycles to use heat to produce a variety of end uses. So waste heat comes in a wide ranges, uh, wide ranges of temperatures, and based on that, you can do a variety of these uh, thermal conversions to get some end uses. So if you have microturbine exhaust air which comes out at this temperature, you can do absorption cooling. Say if you use a double effect heat pump, you get this output. If you have a truck engine exhaust or a process plant waste heat, you can do organic Rankine cycle vapor compression. You can do organic Rankine cycle to produce power or you can produce cooling with this. You can do combustion exhaust and you can do absorption cooling at a single effect level and this assembly of components will get you uh, some cooling. And so on, we can do a variety of base cases of high temperatures, low temperatures, even data center waste heat can be used, perhaps not to produce cooling or something, but there are things known as heat transformers where you can upgrade that large quantity of low grade heat that is not being used to produce higher temperature heat, which can then be sold as a, as a useful commodity for say things like laundries, for sterilization, and those kinds of uh, pasteurization, those kinds of purposes, okay? So we've done these kinds of studies to sort of lay out how we can use waste heat in a different uh, ways to produce different end uses, okay? So uh, one of my main areas of interest is thermally driven heat pumps. Now, if you look at a typical vapor compression heat pump, a standard conventional air conditioning system, it has an evaporator, it has a compressor, it uses electricity, and then it pumps it up to a high temperature so that the heat can be rejected to the ambient. It comes back across an expansion valve and goes into an evaporator. This is the standard air conditioning system or the standard refrigeration system. But it uses electricity, which is a high-grade energy source, and it also uses synthetic fluids usually, and these have high global warming potential and so on. Instead, you can use heat to drive this system where you use the heat, perhaps it is from solar, perhaps it is from some waste heat and so on, and instead of uh, running electricity, you boil a refrigerant out of a solution, and then this part of the cycle remains the same, and then when this evaporated refrigerant does its cooling, it mixes back into the uh, solution so that now you need to pump liquid rather than compress vapor. And pumping up liquid takes maybe a hundredth of the energy that is needed to compress vapor. So your electrical requirements go down to a very, very small fraction of the total energy requirements. And then there is some recuperation in here. Basically, you are using heat, and then you're using natural fluids, not synthetic fluids, to run this system. But you can see the issue here. You took a compressor, which was one component, and now you replaced it with many other components, okay? So you have to put in more capital cost into the heat exchangers. In fact, that would be what a single effect system looks like, and people over the many, many years, include in the US, in Japan, in Korea, in, in Europe, many places, they have studied more and more complicated cycles to improve the coefficient of performance a little bit. So this is called a double effect cycle where the first amount of refrigerant that's generated, as it is uh, condensing, it gives off some heat and you can generate a little bit more refrigerant so that with the same external energy input, you get a little bit more cooling, so your COP increases a little bit. Your coefficient of performance improves a little bit. Here's a dual cycle which does something similar. You run a lithium bromide cycle, use the waste heat from there to run an ammonia water cycle. And then there are things known as generator, absorber, heat exchange cycles, and so on. There is substantial internal heat recuperation here to provide higher cycle efficiencies. But it also means that it is increased number of components, more surface area, more cost, and more complexity and controls. Until now, 
research efforts to do these kinds of things have not been very successful because the customers do not want to pay large amounts of money for these kinds of complex systems, and they're also very large, okay, for incremental improvements in efficiency. So, in our lab, we've tried to simplify these kinds of systems, okay, but we are trying to do this with very low temperature differences. Because this is waste heat we are talking about now, okay, the temperature of that heat is at lower temperatures than fresh fossil energy. So we have to do with less delta T available to do our thermodynamic processes. And so if you look at this basic equation of heat transfer, you have less delta T, and if you still want to have the same output, the same end use, you have some choices. You can either increase the heat transfer coefficient or you can increase the surface area, okay? You need some more surface area, you need more heat transfer coefficient, and you need to use that available delta T better. When you go to the micro scales, you get higher surface area to volume ratios so that you can pack more surface area into the same space. And on top of that, you also get high heat transfer coefficients at the micro scales. So you get these two advantages. But sometimes people forget that it also gives you many other advantages. It reduces the number, uh, the amount of fluid that you need to put into these systems. And many of these fluids can either be expensive or dangerous or have high global warming and so on. So you get this extra benefit. And when you have these small components with very small amount of fluid, they can cost less. And, and it's when you're a big company fabricating these and shipping these to the other places, the shipping costs go down too. But to be able to do all of this, you need to understand the fundamentals of heat transfer at these micro scales so that you can apply those principles to de design these better systems and processes. So I'll spend a few slides talking about some of our basic heat and mass transfer experiments and analyses, and then I'll go back to showing how that understanding and those insights are used to develop innovative systems, okay? So let's look at internal flows. Many years ago, in the late 1990s, we started doing research on condensation uh, in micro scales. At the time, the only information available was on air-water mixtures, and it is uh, incorrect to extrapolate the flow regimes and so on from those air-water mixtures to refrigerants, which are different kinds of fluids. We studied the influence of tube size, tube shape, and then orientation and so on. We did flow visualization experiments Okay. I saw some flow visualization experiments today in uh, one of the la labs here, and they're doing some wonderful work. Uh, the, the flow regimes we saw were in boiling. These are in condensation. So the idea is to understand how the fluid flows at different conditions, different mass flow rates, different vapor liquid uh, fractions, and so on. Once you understand this, then you can develop better heat transfer models based on these flow mechanisms. And so we can come up with a flow regime map of mass flux versus quality, for example. And what we noticed was, as you go to smaller and smaller diameters, then this wavy flow regime goes away because the influence of gravity becomes less and the influence of surface tension increases. And so that gravity-dominated region goes away. And the intermittent region, this kind of region, increases. The annular flow region increases. So these kinds of understandings help us model the flow better. And we can then model this kind of flow as the flow of a vapor bubble followed by a liquid slug. And we also account for the fact that this liquid has to accelerate around this when it goes to this small cross-sectional area, and then it decelerates across this. So we calculate the pressure drop as a function of the total pressure drop due to the slug, due to the film bubble interface, and due to these transitions, and our models are better able to predict that. So we know the components of this pressure drop better. And then, whereas using the other correlations in the literature, the agreement between the data and the measurements uh, and the predictions is not very good, sometimes off by almost 100% or even more, our models were able to predict this much better. So now we know how to predict pressure drop in very, very small channels during condensation. We, we go, uh, a step further where we can actually track this. If you know the time at which this bubble is at various locations, you can actually calculate the bubble velocity. 
you can also document events like bubble coalescence, two bubbles joined together to form one, and this helps us get better models. Not only that, we can actually track this. We can, we can do uh, edge detection techniques and so on, and calculate the actual volume occupied by the bubble versus the liquid, and then come up with these models based on the shape of that interface okay, to figure out how much space the vapor phase is occupying, how much space the liquid phase is occupying, how this is distributed across the channel, and so on. And then you can even use that as a dynamic signal to predict the different kinds of flow. So intermittent flow will have this kind of a signal. Uh, uh, the wavy flow will have this kind of signal, annular flow will have this kind of signal, and so on. So these can be used to predict the flow regimes by sensing some of these parameters. Okay? And then we do some heat transfer experiments using photolithography, etched channels in very, very small uh, geometries to predict heat transfer coefficients. Um, when you do these kinds of experiments, the axial conduction becomes important because this is copper test sections. And so um, you have to account for this axial conduction. So we segment the test sections and measure the heat transfer in each section so that we are removing the effect of axial conduction and only accounting for the uh, heat transfer due to the uh, two-phase flow. The other thing is, if you look at this, this wall of the tube, okay, um, for one instant, you get a bubble flowing by. For the next instant, you see a liquid film flowing by. So it sees different heat transfer coefficients intermittently. So does this affect the actual heat transfer that goes on in the wall? So we did a, a dynamic closed form analysis to predict the variation in the heat transfer coefficient with time, accounting for the thermal lag in the wall. And then we were able to demonstrate that, yes, the heat transfer coefficient will change with time, but uh, in many cases, that variation in the heat transfer coefficient of that liquid is relatively small compared to the total delta T that is available between the refrigerant and the coolant. But these um, very careful models let us predict the heat transfer coefficients. And just like we did for pressure drop, we also now account for the fact that if it's a condensing bubble, the amount of liquid in that, in that uh, uh, tube increases from the uh, one end of the tube, uh, one end of the bubble to the other, and we are able to calculate that variation in film thickness, and then come up with heat transfer coefficients for the slug region and for the film region, and come up with a composite heat transfer coefficient. So with these kinds of things, then we can also do some uh, extrapolation from CO2 to R134A, and we've demonstrated that just by doing experiments on one fluid, by applying some corresponding states principles, and I think Professor uh, Takata is doing a lot of uh, fluid properties uh, uh, type of work, and the critical pressure becomes very important. And just by a critical pressure transformation, you can take results that you get on R134A and get to CO2 uh, heat transfer coefficients without doing any new experiments. So now we are also doing mixtures, OK? Mixtures are very important in today's uh, world because when you boil a pure fluid, it boils at a constant temperature, right? But if you're trying to recover low-grade heat, it's changing temperature. If you, if you take some heat from that heat, if you take some heat from that source, it lowers in temperature. Whereas if you're stuck with a constant temperature phase change process, there's a pinch point that happens. And so instead, if you use a mixture, as the, the mixture boils, its saturation temperature changes, and so you can play with the concentration of that mixture to match this temperature profile. And so we're doing multi-component mixture experiments so that we can harvest low temperature waste heat better. And this is also useful for things like geothermal heat recovery, where the temperatures are lower than fossil fuels. Okay, we've done supercritical heat transfer experiments, and I saw some of them um, earlier today in the labs here. Whereas they are doing boiling or, or supercritical heating experiments, we did supercritical cooling experiments at 20% uh, uh, above critical pressure, 10% above critical pressure, uh, at critical pressure, and very close to the critical pressure. Okay. And 
when this happens, when you're doing supercritical cooling, it is a, a metastable state. So therefore, when you change the temperature, it looks like a gas, okay? It behaves like a gas, and all of a sudden, across a small temperature difference, it changes density to start behaving like a liquid. This is a drastic change. Similarly, the specific heat goes through a big, uh, big peak, and so that is reflected in the heat transfer coefficients, okay? And we, through some very, very careful experiments, we were able to track this peak in heat transfer coefficients, and we were also able to track this change in pressure drop. So it's behaving like a gas here, and all of a sudden, when it reaches the, the critical point, it changes to a liquid-like behavior, and for the same mass flux, same tube, everything, it suddenly changes pressure drop by several orders of mag by an order of magnitude. So we were able to measure those, and we were also able to develop models for that. And so now we are able to use these better fluids for vapor compression heat pumps and for other, other systems, okay? So a few slides now on external flows, and then we have the knowledge for internal flows, we have the knowledge for external flows, and then we can design some interesting systems for uh, carbon neutral energy utilization, okay? So one of the most common configurations for external flows is a tube bank, right? And if you look at a falling film on just a vertical wall, and if it is a, a process which is not just condensation or boiling, but if it is an absorption of vapor into a liquid, then it has velocity profiles, it has temperature profiles, and it has concentration profiles, okay, in the vapor phase and in the liquid phase. But a real fluid never flows like this. There are always waves, okay? If you've seen rain fall on the windows, you will see that the, the water flows in waves. And so these are called capillary waves, and if you increase the mass flux a little bit more, you get these inertial roll waves, okay? And so you can see that the concentration profiles, the velocity profiles, and so on will be quite different here than here. And then if you get these roll waves, there are internal recirculations that are set up. So we have to account for all of these. And when you put it on a tube, on a horizontal tube, and then the effect of gravity is changing along the tube circumference too, okay? So uh, many years ago, we tried to understand how this happens, and we noticed that not only is the tube uh, surface behavior important, but how the fluid goes from one tube to the other is very, very important. And most of the models in the literature do not account for this intertube region and assume that it magically shows up as a, as a film, okay, as a smooth film. So we did some detailed uh, high-speed flow visualization and discovered that the liquid actually forms a big droplet, the droplet extends, it stretches into a thin filament, and then there are instabilities when it breaks up into these droplets, right? And these oscillating droplets and then when it falls, you can look at what happens when it falls here. There is a redistribution of the velocity, temperature, and concentration boundary layers that happens. And then when the, the drop falls, there are these waves, these saddle-shaped waves that are set up on the tube surface. And that sweeps away the old cold fluid or the, the saturated concentrated fluid and brings in new fluid into which more absorption can happen. And then you also notice that this drop never really merges into this film because of surface tension. So all of these are real phenomena. You look at this, it, uh, it, it will never get absorbed into that, okay? So we have to account for these surface tension dominated effects also. So we first did a detailed uh, edge detection analysis and traced the path of this uh, liquid and then we were able to calculate the surface area and volume. And if you look at this, the surface area and volume remain approximately the same as it goes through the initial phases. But then when the, it breaks up into these small droplets, that same amount of liquid is now distributed into smaller uh, droplets, more surface area, less, uh, so more surface area because of these more droplets, and so you get more locations where absorption can happen. So once we understood that, we then did our own independent computational fluid dynamics analyses. We didn't take any information from this except the geometry, and we were able to replicate this very well 
the uh, droplet is extending, you will see the breakup and the instabilities, okay? And then you will see the uh, waves being set up, the, the surface waves. When, when the drop falls, you see what happens here. The processes have been replicated quite well. See this, the surface waves. So now we, under, we are able to model the actual phenomena in tube banks very well. And then these are concentration profiles. Okay? As the absorption process proceeds, this is a cooled tube. And as the cooling happens, there's more and more absorption that's happening. And we're able to track that in full three dimensions and uh, in space also. So the cool tube is here, and then as the droplet is separating from this cool tube, there's no more cooling, but more absorption is happening, so it heats up, and then when it falls on this, it cools down again. So that process has been replicated, okay? So this gives us insights into how you can design these kinds of tube banks if you don't pay attention to that droplet formation and the optimal distribution of the tube bank spacing and so on, you get this. This is not a good configuration because the film thicknesses are too high. This is a poor heat transfer mechanism. You're also not getting any droplets and so on for additional absorption. So we can use our insights to design better systems. Okay. So with that, now let's transition we, we covered some fundamentals of heat and mass transfer. Now let's see if we can use that to design some interesting systems, okay? This is one of my students who did a master's thesis, and this was his master's thesis output. We, we used our understanding of condensation and microscales to build a wearable cooling system. So it's a small model aircraft engine. Kids in the US play with a lot of these model aircraft engines. And then uh, we took one of those uh, bicycle pumps, the foot pumps to, to pump your bicycle tire, we converted that into a compressor, into a homemade compressor. We, we coupled that with bevel gears and so on to that model aircraft engine, and then we developed this vapor compression system where the evaporator is actually this jacket that the, the student wears, and there are cooled tubes inside here. These are cooled tubes, and that keeps his body cold, and uh, so you provide a little bit of fuel here in this tank, and this five kilogram unit, with the appropriate amount of fuel, can keep it going for about six hours of cooling, okay? With two liters of fuel, you can go on for six hours of cooling. And with about almost 50 degrees Celsius ambient, the body can be kept cool. In fact, the student demonstrated this by running on a treadmill, an inclined treadmill, in a in one of those environmental chambers maintained at close to 50 degrees Celsius, and he was able to uh, keep himself cool in that process. Okay. I was talking to Professor Koyama yesterday, and I said that we have developed these uh, um, CO2 gas coolers, where uh, instead of the, uh, the, the, the uh, simple tubes that are being used by one of the Japanese manufacturers, we came up with these microchannel configurations where we cleverly arranged the tube orientations so that even though they are cross-flow heat exchangers, they behave like counter-flow heat exchangers through pass arrangements. And so when you're doing this gas cooling, if the process ends here and you're expanding here, then you're wasting a lot of this vapor liquid dome and you're only getting this much evaporation. But if you design a better heat exchanger and cool it down much further, all the way down here, you're using almost all of the dome. So with these kinds of configurations, we are able to get better compact geometries for a um, electrically driven cooling system that uses uh, CO2 and in the process also provides hot water. So it, it's, a, it's a heat pump that provides cooling as well as water heating. Okay? In absorption, we, uh, based on our understanding of external flows, we came up with this idea of taking these microchannels and arranging them into this crisscross pattern, okay? And then this is uh, a 12 centimeter by 12 centimeter by about 50 centimeter, 48 centimeter device that is an absorber for a residential uh, 10 kilowatt cooling system, okay? So what happens here is you drop ammonia, just you pour ammonia on top, and then, uh, sorry, the ammonia water solution on top, you bring in vapor from below, 
as the vapor rises, it absorbs into that solution and creates concentrated solution. And that heat of absorption is taken away by coolant that is flowing through the tubes. So these are microchannels. So the tube side heat transfer coefficient is very, very high. And then because of this lattice structure and frequent interactions of those droplets as they fall down, the, the outside heat transfer coefficient, the mass transfer coefficient is very, very high. These are self-distributing. So even if it is maldistributed at the top, it redistributes itself. So with this, we are able to come up with this very, very compact geometry. Furthermore, while this was an absorber, with a simple change in the tray in this distributor, we can make this function as a, dis, uh, as a desorber. So this can also generate vapor. Instead of selling, sending cooling water through this, if we send our heat source through the tubes, okay, if we send hot water through the tubes, then it will boil off the refrigerant. So the exact same component can function as a absorber, as a desorber. It can also function as a condenser, evaporator. So if you are a manufacturer making these heat pumps, just by one type of geometry, you put four of these together, you get yourself a heat pump. Okay? So a compact uh, heat pump, thermally driven heat pump, through the exploitation of microchannels, okay, heat transfer in microchannels. Our latest uh, uh, project is this. We've been working on this for a few years, and we have a, a fairly large project funded by um, an, a new agency called ARPA-E. Uh, a few years ago, my, one of my PhD students and I, we decided to put a challenge in front of ourselves. I said, let us build a heat pump, a, a complete heat pump, not just one component of a heat pump, one complete heat pump that's smaller than the textbook that we use for undergraduate heat transfer. Okay? This is the textbook that we use. And in fact, the student uh, and, and I worked together, and we designed this. This, is, this looks like one piece, but it is actually all components of a heat pump integrated into one package. So how we do this is we take two sheets, very thin sheets, 0.5 millimeter sheets, and we etch passages in those sheets that represents multiple different components. If you look at this, so this would be the desorber, this would be the condenser, this would be a solution heat exchanger, this might be the absorber, the, the recuperative heat exchanger, the evaporator, and so on. So you take two sheets. Okay, one side carries the coupling fluid, the, wa the cooling water and so on. The other side carries the ammonia water solution. Just two sheets would form a heat pump. Now those two sheets won't transfer much heat. So you put as many sheets as you want for the cooling load that you want. So if it's a small, uh, small system, you put just a few sheets. If you have a, a lot of cooling needs, you put larger, more sheets together and then you bond them together. And this plus a pump, plus a solution pump, is your overall heat pump. So we are able to exploit not only microchannel heat and mass transfer, but we've integrated everything into a monolithic component so that there are no plumbing uh, losses. There's no heat gains and losses as the fluid has to go from one place to another. There is no extra fluid needed to fill up all those plumbing lines from the inside of the house to the outside of the house, and it becomes a very small system that can be easily fabricated in mass production and shipped uh, uh, nicely. So this, this actually, this uh, small book-sized heat pump generated 300 watts. This was a very initial proof of concept unit. We were able to provide 300 watts of cooling with this system. Now we are working on developing uh, a conventional three uh, three ton or 10 kilowatt cooling uh, systems using this technology. And probably next year we'll have a, a prototype of this. Okay? And we can either install these as window air conditioner units or we can put them distributed in different rooms in the house. So if one room needs uh, some amount of cooling, the other room needs a different amount of cooling, you can spread these around. And also, especially in Japan and Korea and places like that, you heat your floors. And so you can, you can send this heated water through the floors so that you get excellent, uh, efficient heating. So you can install these. So here's the hot uh, source coming in. And then you get the, the heating through these orange lines. And you get the cooling through the blue lines. Okay? 
that was that was sort of residential and small scale applications. I talked about megawatt scale applications. Um, and I believe I, I, I saw this in Professor Koyama's lab yesterday, uh, where there is a lot of waste. If you look at a naval aircraft carrier, it consumes a lot of energy. Okay, It actually, to produce about 100 megawatts of power, it consumes 300 megawatts of energy and so there is 200 megawatts of waste heat that's available. So we took that waste heat and we ran it through a lithium bromide water absorption system to provide uh, cold water at approximately 5 Celsius. So that can be used for uh, cabin cooling and so on in the ship, but if you also use that as the heat rejection coolant for a CO2 vapor compression system, this bottoming cycle, you put a little bit of electricity in it, and then you use this, and you can get minus 40, minus 50 Celsius coolant that you can use to cool high-powered electronics and so on. So we demonstrated that with 200 megawatts of waste heat input, we can get approximately 90 megawatts of cooling at 5 Celsius, and another additional 50 megawatts of cooling at minus 40 Celsius. So we are able to get from 200 megawatts of waste heat, uh, almost 140 megawatts of cooling with just a little bit of electrical input. So this is a, a substantial savings, especially in ships for the military and so on, where fuel is extremely expensive. But to be able to make this happen, you need uh, evaporation of water and you need uh, condensation of CO2. CO2 is a very high pressure fluid water evaporation is occurring at almost near vacuum conditions. So this is a tricky problem, and the solution we came up with is you can use microscale condensation of CO2 inside these flat tubes, like uh, automotive heat exchangers. You take a typical shell and tube heat exchanger, you replace the tubes with these kinds of flat tubes, and then you do falling film evaporation on the outside. So this is a high a uh, heat transfer coefficient internal condensation process. CO2 is an excellent fluid, and condensation is a, is a very nice process, so you get excellent heat transfer coefficient on the inside. Falling film evaporation of water, and Professor Takata has done some work in this, uh, is, is another excellent heat transfer coefficient process. Okay, And so we demonstrated that in a fairly small package, about 2.5 meters by 2.5 meters by 2 meters, we can transfer 40 megawatts across a delta T of only 3 Kelvin using this. So a conventional shell and tube heat exchanger, we are applying the, 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 the novelty here is, usually when you talk about micro scale processes and micro channel heat exchangers and so on, you're talk, thinking about electronics cooling or you know, 5 or 10 watts of cooling. Well, we've shown that you can apply those same principles to very, very large systems and you can get much more benefit because these systems are very large, and when you apply this to these large processes, you can really cut down the size. Okay. Another way we are trying to do the carbon neutral type of processes is vapor jet refrigeration with ejectors. Now, here again, there is a waste heat source, and usually you would need a turbo compressor here. Instead, we are using a vapor jet ejector. Essentially, the way it works is it has no moving parts, and you're taking a high pressure fluid and you send it through the nozzle and then it entrains the surrounding fluid and it's able to pump it. So that replaces a turbine and a compressor. And so my student is studying this both experimentally as a refrigeration system and she's also running experiments to understand the, the supersonic processes that happen inside. So this is a completely passive system and she's studying uh, different types of fluids. So if you've taken an advanced thermodynamics course, you'll see that there are dry refrigerants and wet refrigerants, depending on how the process happens on this side. Okay? So she's studying these processes, and these are uh, some flow visualization pictures of the processes inside. So you can see the shock diamonds progressing through. Okay? So she's done both experiments as well as CFD, and you can replicate these processes. And we're uh, improving these models as time goes on. Okay? Now, the absorption systems we talked about um, they still need that solution pump. And in some places, especially in developing countries, there may not be the electricity infrastructure to even support a, a small pump. And so we're trying to use just the heat 
to do the pumping also. So we, have, we are developing this bubble pump. First, we are understanding the complicated uh, CFD uh, or, or the fluid mechanics processes. Essentially, the buoyancy of that bubble is what is driving this column of liquid up. And so we implement this in a constant pressure, constant total pressure system. So the delta P that is required is not from a low pressure to a high pressure. It just simply needs to overcome the frictional losses in this cycle. We use a third fluid as a carrier fluid to take care of that. So we're developing that. And once we come up with this, it will need no electricity input. It will be a completely thermally driven heat pump. We're also doing some adsorption research, and there's a lot of expertise in this room. Uh, Professor Saha has been doing uh, adsorption research for many, many years. The way this works is it's a batch process. Okay? You take a bed, and you put heat in, and it desorbs the refrigerant from there. Okay? And then it condenses, and then after that phase ends, and then you can cool it so that this gets absorbed into this and then you have the evaporation process. And then you switch them. So you can use it either in one bed or you can do two beds so that you can phase lag the two of them and they can provide a relatively constant uh, cooling. So that process, you can use different fluids uh, or different, different working pairs. So an activated carbon fiber ethanol process, this is one isotherm, this is another isotherm. And you can use this to find out how much mass of this bed you need to support some amount of cooling. So you can do these and pick for the waste heat source that's available, you pick the right combination of this working pair. Whereas adsorption systems typically have lower coefficients of performance than absorption systems, the advantage is they can use a wide varying sources of heat and you can use very low grade heat uh, with these processes. So, so we've done some system level analyses, and you can see that we've tracked the transient process, the transient thermal processes. We've tracked the temperature of the, the, the two beds and the condenser and the evaporator, and the actual amount of heat that can be uh, delivered uh, through some very, very detailed analyses of the thermal masses and the heat transfer coefficients in these. And then We've taken it from interparticle uh, heat and mass transfer all the way to the design of the beds. In these kinds of systems, if the system is undersized, you cannot just put in more fins and more, uh, more amount of metal because, yes, it gives you more heat transfer, but the thermal mass of those fins becomes higher, and you're cycling it up and down, up and down every cycle, and you're losing a lot of uh, useful energy. So we've done some optimization studies on that. Uh, a couple of more technologies, and then I'll, I'll close the talk uh, and open it up for questions. So we're using adsorption for carbon capture. Okay? So if you look at power plant exhaust, okay, it's a dilute stream of CO2. We want to take the CO2 out of that. So we, one of our colleagues in chemical engineering has developed these hollow fibers, which are very, very low in thermal mass. So the problem with carbon capture technologies is they suffer from thermal mass limitations. But if you use these hollow fibers coated with adsorbent, and then you do mass transfer into this, and you supply hot water that you draw from the power plant okay, to heat up that later on. So you first adsorb it by sending cold water through the, the fiber. The CO2 is adsorbed. The rest of it goes away. Now the CO2 is there. In the next phase of the cycle, you heat it up with water you would throw away anyway, hot water you would throw away. And then you desorb it, and you collect the CO2. This is how we are capturing the CO2. There are some purity issues and so on that we are addressing. So there's a trade-off between how pure you want that CO2 and how much CO2 you want to withdraw. And we've developed a thermal wave process. This is from the adsorption heat pump literature. We've, we've adapted that to this process so that the external amount of heat that you need to supply is very, very small because we recuperate from one phase of the cycle. We take all that heat, store it, and put it into the next phase so that we don't need to supply a lot of extra heat. So carbon capture technologies have usually suffered because they need a lot of extra energy. And if you need a lot of extra energy, you might as well not do it because you're burning more fuel to do the carbon capture. So if you reduce the energy consumption of this process, then uh, it becomes viable, which is what we are trying to demonstrate. Okay. 
So, one last topic is uh, we are doing electrochemical thermal storage. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Japan is a, is a leader in this field with your Prius and so on. Whereas, uh, typical batteries uh, that go into this and so on, they don't go through a lot of charge discharge cycles, full charge and deep discharge and deep charge cycles. But in a car, if the battery is the one that's driving it, every day you're taking it from high charge to high discharge stage. And no matter how efficient that, that chemical to electrical conversion is, there is some heat being lost. And that heat has to be dissipated. Now, the internals of the batteries, lithium ion batteries, are very poor thermal conductivity materials. So even though not much heat has to be released, this is going across a very low thermal conductivity material and there are thermal gradients that are set up. So we are using microchannels to integrate them into the current collectors in this and then we send a phase change fluid through it and as the heat is dissipated, it evaporates that fluid, it goes out to the condenser and then passively it, for, it comes back. So it's a completely passive system and we're able to achieve uniform temperature distribution. When you do this, differential corrosion goes away and then when the when the battery discharges usually what happens is when you have these kinds of temperature gradients one part of the battery discharges very fast and then the rest of it cannot discharge because the cycle has ended and so you're wasting a lot of that charge that you've you've placed into it but if you make it much more uniform you can get more charge uh, per cycle and you also extend the life because you don't have differential corrosion and so on and then we are also looking at things like short circuiting, where we're doing transient coupled electrochemical, electrical thermal processes. So if there's a short circuit in this, uh, thermal energy is released locally, and then that spreads, and this is what causes uh, something known as thermal runaway, and we are able to predict it, and we are developing strategies to mitigate that. Okay. So with this, we'll be able to uh, make thermal storage or the electrochemical thermal storage uh, feasible as time goes on. Okay. So a few concluding remarks. I've shown you some um, ways that we can implement thermal sciences to uh, improve the energy consumption uh, or, or decrease the energy consumption. This is a slide from, uh, from a paper I read uh, many years ago. This is not my work, but uh, this author um, plotted the annual per capita electricity use for a variety of countries and the Human Development Index, which is a UN measure of how um, people are, uh, people's qualities of lives are. One of the things that you notice is, yes, the more energy you spend, uh, the, there is a sharp increase in the level of uh, happiness or the level of quality of life. But then once you get to say, uh, the human development index of a Spain or something like that, okay? More energy consumption doesn't get you a significant improvement in uh, human development index, which means that these countries are just wasting a lot of energy. Of course, U.S. and Canada are the worst offenders, but uh, even Japan could do a little bit better, okay? Um, so, if you look at Canada, it's consuming 16,000 kilowatt hours, whereas Spain is, is uh, consuming 4,000. So for a four times additional energy investment, their human development index changed by maybe 0.5. So as engineers, if we can do innovations through the kinds of technologies that I talked about, we can reduce the per capita energy consumption, and still maintain the quality of life to very high levels. Okay. This is what carbon neutral energy utilization is all about. You use as little as possible while maintaining quality of life. Okay, okay my concluding remarks are energy and climate challenges um, present opportunities. They're not just challenges, but they're opportunities. In fact, because energy costs are rising, people might be willing to put in a little bit more capital costs to save energy. So some of the technologies that didn't work in the past maybe will work now because it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. 
The idea is to change, to bring about changes that affect lifestyles, but not the quality of life. You keep the human development index the same, but you reduce the energy consumption. So these are not just slogans, but practical solutions, okay? As I said, most of the energy uh, that is available is in thermal form. To me, as a heat transfer engineer, the ideal world is a perfectly glide match set of counterflow heat exchangers. Okay? This is what we were talking about in the class earlier today, that you want glide matched heat exchangers, counterflow, and then everything will be okay. And research on things like fluid flow and heat and mass transfer is crucial to bring about this sustainable energy revolution. And the idea is to, once you've deployed that new jewel of fossil fuel, Okay, keep that in play as long as possible. Okay, don't burn another new jewel until you've exhausted its potential all the way. And I am illustrating this here. This is a schematic of a toy that uh, uh, kids use. Where they take a marble and then they, they throw it down, right? Through these, these cascades. So compare this with this. And now think of it as one unit of energy is burned. Would you like to burn it like this, or would you like to burn it like this? Okay. If you do it like this, then for that same amount of energy that you consumed, you get one process, two, three, four, five, six, seven processes for the same amount of energy input. And if you are in industry, you can sell seven products rather than just one product. So this is an opportunity for industry too, okay? And these are my students that help me do most of this work. It's a, it's a wonderful set of uh, very, very hardworking and innovative students and they keep me busy. So once again, uh, arigato, uh, goiz, uh, yeah, thank, gozai, gozai misu, thank you. Because I'm massive.